Much like solids and liquids, gases are one of the phases of matter that you're probably intuitively aware of, but don't formally define a lot. And so as we start to discuss gases, we should just come up with a very, very simple description of what makes gases unique. And I think the most unique things about gases are that they are a very high energy phase of matter. The particles all have a lot of energy and they collide with each other. These collisions are elastic and we treat the intermolecular forces between these particles as being negligible or non-existent. And this is one thing that definitely distinguishes gases from liquids because liquids have intermolecular forces, whereas gases don't. But gases and liquids are both classified as fluids because they take on the shape of their container and they can move or flow together with a sort of uniform translational motion. So these are all just sort of qualities of gases and gases are something that you're probably aware of already. So what we'll do now is we'll just accept this as our definition, not get too in depth with it. And then we'll move on to some of the most unique qualities of gases that can be tested in physical chemistry. The first thing is to look at this ideal gas law. PV equals nRT. This is the most important equation when you're dealing with gases. And P here stands for pressure, V for volume, N stands for the number or the number of moles. R is a gas constant that can take many different forms and have many different units. And T is the temperature. The units for these can vary depending on what you're provided when you're working through a question. You might see pressure measured in pascals, atmospheres, millimeters of mercury or tor. Volume could be expressed as liters or cubic meters. N will probably be expressed as moles. And temperature is almost always going to be in Kelvin. You're unlikely to deal with PV NRT questions involving degrees Celsius, for example. A lot of times, whatever units you're provided for R will give you the list of units that you'll be using for all these other properties. Now, for this ideal gas law to work, we make an assumption that we're working with what's called an ideal gas. And an ideal gas is something where we assume that the particles have no volume whatsoever. They don't take up any space. They're infinitely small. And we also consider that there are absolutely no intermolecular interactions, which is fairly true, but sometimes it's not exact. Sometimes there are dipole-dipole interactions or momentary dipoles between particles, but for an ideal gas, we assume that there are no intermolecular interactions and that they simply collide in an elastic way. Every once in a while, you'll be asked a question about a real gas versus an ideal gas. And the big distinction that is being made there is that we can no longer make these assumptions about a gas being completely ideal. Instead of being absolutely devoid of volume, the particles actually do have a small amount of volume. And so the volume of a real gas will be slightly greater than the volume that you calculate for an ideal gas. And that's because not only is there space between the molecules or atoms, but the molecules or atoms, or we'll just call them particles, those particles carry a bit of volume themselves. And so that makes the volume of the real gas slightly greater. The interesting thing is that this formula still tends to hold up very well. And if PV equals NRT, and V is a little bit greater than we would calculate using this, we can assume then that if, P, if V is greater, P must be a little bit smaller if PV is going to equal NRT. And so the pressure that you might observe in a real gas when you're correcting for the fact that the particles do actually have some volume, the pressure will be a little bit less in the real gas than it is with our ideal gas. Very rarely will you need to actually calculate the real volume or the real pressure in cases where you're deviating from ideal gases, but just be aware that that distinction exists. That the volume of a real gas will be slightly greater because the particles actually do occupy a little bit of volume. And because this V is going up, but this equation still holds, if V goes up, pressure will likely go down just a little bit. So the pressure of a real gas, whenever you're asked about that, will likely be a little bit less than the pressure that you calculate with an ideal gas. 
And once you have established the PV equals NRT, we can go through a lot of different manifestations of this formula that you'll see and can be very, very useful in analyzing problems that come up that involve gases and their quantities of volume, pressure, number of moles, temperature, and so on.